Well, welcome back to our Romans class. Uh, there's an outline in the back if you don't have one. Uh, but we're in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, the greatest book ever written, Romans. What a privilege it is to study the book of Romans, to be able to teach the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. The Apostle Paul declared boldly in Romans chapter 1 that he was not ashamed of the gospel, and not ashamed of the gospel. And when we study that, uh, we learned that that was a, a latotes. Latotes, that's a, uh, an argument or, or a statement that's made in the form of a negative statement uh, to emphasize uh, the other aspect of it, the positive. Uh, Paul said he was excited, he was eager, he was ready to preach the gospel. He was, not, he was uh, most um, proud of the gospel. It was a message that the world needed to hear. Uh, Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, he said in Romans chapter 1. Uh, it's the righteousness of God revealed, the righteousness that we need. <laughs> we need that righteousness. That's the only remedy, Paul says, the only remedy that will save us from the wrath of God. Uh, you know, if the doctor were to prescribe something uh, for you, and he says, this is the only remedy, uh, the only thing that will cure you, <laughs> you'd be most certain uh, to, uh, to guard that medicine, uh, to keep it in a safe place, uh, to make sure that you took it at the right time each and every day. The only thing that will save us from the wrath of God is the gospel. Uh, then because the wrath of God, God's wrath, is really so poorly understood, and in fact, it's really neglected. Uh, we don't want to hear about God's wrath. Paul spends uh, quite a bit of time uh, describing it, uh, the God's wrath. He spends some time showing that all humanity, first of all, is under uh, God's wrath. All of humanity, in particular, that's in chapter 1. In particular, I believe that applies to those uh, men and women who lived in the time before the flood. Before the flood, when the world was in a moral freefall, moral freefall. But of course, as you read Romans chapter 1, you realize it doesn't take a whole lot of study to realize that that chapter applies to our society today. Uh, we're not in a moral freefall, but we're, in a, we're falling morally. Uh, and we're following the same path uh, that uh, societies have followed over the centuries the same downward path. Uh, that's because there's a natural tendency within us, uh, we call it sin, uh, to, uh, that pulls us downward. Uh, humanity, in general, is under God's wrath. Uh, those who consider themselves moral men and women are under God's wrath. That's in Romans chapter 2, uh, where Paul describes, first of all, the hypocrite, um, the moral man, the man who's ready to judge others, but not so quick to judge himself. And then the religious man, the Jew of, of, of Paul's day was a religious man. But of course, there are many different types of religions in our day. Those who consider, consider themselves to be religious men are under God's wrath, God's condemnation um, in chapter 2. Uh, but Paul's not done yet. Paul's not done yet. Um, Paul was, a, you know, an experience, a, a well-experienced a well-practiced debater. Maybe we sort of think of those times that in the first century church that Paul lived in as sort of idyllic uh, and, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and peaceful and calm, but quite the opposite was true. We don't actually have any of Paul's debates recorded in Scripture, but we know he debated with those on Mars Hill. We know he debated with uh, uh, various uh, Jewish congregations as he went into the synagogues, as he preached the gospel. Uh, no doubt, there were hecklers. No doubt there were hecklers. Now, tomatoes are a new world fruit, uh, so there weren't any tomatoes in Paul's day, so they couldn't throw tomatoes at Paul, uh, but no doubt they threw some words at Paul. No doubt he was heckled in the crowd. Perhaps they threw things more than words as Paul preached the gospel. Heck, hecklers and objectors. Uh, the natural man, you see, rises up in indignation, when his sin is confronted, when his sin is exposed. It's no different in Paul's day than it is in our day. If, you are, if you're a preacher of the gospel, if you expose sin, 
you can expect to see some opposition, some vehement opposition. You know, with Satan as their defense lawyers, uh, the, the natural man raises his objections most loudly. He says, that just not, is not, not true, Paul. That's not true. What you said about the moral man, we said about the religious man. I mean, okay, but that's not me. I'm not, I'm not those. I'm not those people. Uh, hecklers. Uh, Paul Gio deals with these hecklers first in chapter 3 before he gets really to what he's been pressing for, uh, for is in the second part of this uh, particular lesson today. Uh, but Paul wants to deal with these hecklers first, proactively, I believe, uh, before they actually have a chance to heckle. Remember, this is a letter Paul has written, but he knows that there are objectors in every crowd. Um, and so he deals with them in verses one, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Uh, and then he takes the place, Paul takes the place of a, uh, of a prosecuting attorney, beginning in verse 9, and he presents the legal case against humanity, the legal case against humanity, mankind's universal guilt. All are guilty. Uh, but Paul is very careful as a teacher, as a preacher of the gospel, as a, a great teacher, we might add, uh, one of the greatest. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul takes nothing for granted, takes nothing for granted as a teacher. He may appear to digress a bit in these first eight verses in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. He may appear to digress. You know, we may be anxious to move forward. In fact, some commentators really do just that. They sort of skip over these verses and they, they, they want to get to the part where it says, there's none righteous, no, not one. All are guilty before God. Uh, but you know, we want to move on. Paul insists, as a great teacher, on providing us some additional light, some additional knowledge, uh, some information that the Apostle Paul believes is essential. In verses 1 through 8, he insists on laying down a firm foundation. Uh, you know, <laughs> Paul's doctrine is no house of cards. Uh, perhaps you've seen a house of cards. You, maybe you've built one before. If not, you know, they're kind of fun to build. You just take these little cards, you start to stack them up, and you put layers on top of them. And if you're really good, you can build quite, a, a, house, quite a, a stack out of these cards. But, you know, a little breeze comes along and whoosh. <laughs> uh, Paul's doctrine is, is not like that. Paul built his doctrine to stand the winds of stress, the winds of, of hecklers. Uh, Paul's doctrine... Uh, we would do well, you know, to follow his example. So we're not going to zoom over these uh, couple verses here uh, in the first part of chapter 3. We're going to spend our time. In Without a foundation of sound doctrine, we will not stand in times of stress and trial. Without a foundation of sound doctrine, we will be carried away by subtle but false teachings. And that's exactly what Paul brings forth here, some subtle teachings uh, that his detractors, his hecklers, if you will, have brought up no doubt in the past. Uh, no doubt Paul has faced these same objections again and again and again. He knows in any sizable crowd of people uh, that these objections are going to rise. Uh, these critical challenges are countered. Point one in your outline, critical challenges. Uh, verses one through eight. What advantage, Paul writes, then hath the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Verse 1, what advantage hath the Jew? You know, why bother with righteousness at all? I just rephrased that. Uh, but it's the same question. What advantage has to do? Why bother with righteousness? You know, Paul has really laid it out. He says, what matters is the heart. What matters is the heart. It's not what you do. It's not uh, uh, um, with your life. It's what your, where your heart is. That's what God looks at. Well, if God, and this heckler says, well, if God cares, all God cares about is the heart, uh, then why waste my time going to the synagogue? Why waste my time going to church? Uh, why should I come to church on Sunday mornings? You know, there's better things I could do with my time uh, than go to church. Why suffer through baptism communion, church membership. You know, if God only sees the heart, I could worship at the beach. I could worship at the fairgrounds. I could worship at the athletic stadium. I could worship anywhere. It's true. Uh, um, but why go to church? 
why spend all my time? Why should I read my Bible? I mean, I've already saved. Let the unsaved man or woman read his Bible. Uh, but me, you know, why bother? Uh, if all that matters is the heart, this is, remember, this is the heckler out in the crowd. Uh, what advantage hath the Jew? If what Paul is saying, it's time to party, party, party. I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. I'm free. Uh, grace has set me free. And now I can do anything I want to do uh, free. Uh, Paul quickly counters. Uh, what advantage then hath the Jew? What profit is there um, of circumcision? Much every way, says Paul. Much every way. There are many many advantages. Paul does not list them all right here. Uh, he, does, he waits till chapter 9 to do that, uh, so you'll have to wait a little bit also. Uh, but chapter 9 is where Paul lists the many, many advantages of the Jew. But here he only lists one. He says, chiefly, chiefly, primarily, uh, first of all, he says, because that, verse 2, unto them, unto the Jew, were committed the oracles of God. Paul quickly counters. He says, much every way, a thousand times, yes, a Jew, the religious man, has an advantage. There is an advantage in coming to church. There is an advantage in becoming a church member. There is an advantage in tithing. There is an advantage in reading your Bible. Uh, wow. But chiefly, the chief advantage is you have a Bible. You have the Word of God in your hand. The Word of God, Paul calls it the oracles of God. Uh, much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. This is a very unique word. And in fact, theologians have pondered over this word and studied it in great detail. Logia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly in the Greek, logia. It's a word that comes from the word logos, which means the word. But, but it's not translated the word, it's translated oracles, because it's a different word, logia, oracles of God. It's actually only used four times in Scripture, this word logia. Uh, here is one of them. It's used in Acts and twice other in the epistles. A word that identifies the Old Testament in particular, the Old Testament, as the oracles of God, an oracular, oracular book. Not merely, you see, a book that contains God's Word, but a book that is God's utterance, an oracle, an oracle, God's utterance. This is the most important a piece of doctrine here in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, the oracles of God. Now you see, there's three views of Scripture, three views of Scripture, uh, three camps, if you will, and everybody is in one of those three camps or groups. Uh, there's one camp that says uh, Scripture are the words of men. Men wrote these things. This is, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting book from a historical point of view. Uh, I mean, to survive so long and we can uh, study and learn things up. But this is the words of men. That's one camp over here, uh, we'll say. Uh, there's another camp uh, that says, well, this book is the words of men and of God. Men and God. God and man cooperated together. You know, and there's, uh, it, 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 within this book, there's, there's some parts of it that are inspire, inspired. There are other parts where it's just the words of men. Men, after all, wrote it down. Men are human. Men are fallible. Um, things have happened over time. Uh, so we, it's going to take some study to extract uh, what actually is God's word uh, out of this book. Uh, so that's another camp, another view. The third view is that this book is literally God's word. Uh, that's what Paul says. It is the logia, the oracles of God. He says it's God's utterance. In fact, he might say, Paul declares the Old Testament is nothing less than God's words, God's speech crystallized. God's words crystallized. Perhaps you've, we don't, it doesn't happen too much in Houston, but perhaps you've been outside on a cold day and when you talked, you know, you're your words came out, and you saw them, sort of. You saw like a fog coming out <laughs> in front of you. It's a cold day, and there's a fog of your words coming out. Well, picture God's words coming out crystallized into diamond. Crystallized into diamond. Diamond is something that's really been around since the, uh, the beginning, because diamonds are forever. Amen. Diamonds are forever. <laughs> diamonds just last. God's words crystallized into diamonds. Uh, that's this book, this book, the Bible, a most precious possession. I hope you have a Bible.
I hope it's a precious possession to you, one that you keep in a safe place, one that you read, you study, you cherish. So believers grow, you see, and discipleship deepens. When the Bible is open, when the Bible is proclaimed as God's inerrant revelation, this is the word of God, thus saith the Lord. Unsaved men and women are born again as the Holy Spirit works through the words of Scripture. Well, it's a power of God, Paul says, unto salvation of the gospel. Our Christians are convicted of sin through the Bible. They're enabled to turn from sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christians are sanctified through the word of God. Christians are learn God's will and God's wisdom through a study of the Bible. This Bible. But I digress a bit. <laughs> I digress a bit. Let's get back to our question. What advantage has this book, specifically the Old Testament, the oracles of God, what, book had, what advantage had that book to the Jew? What advantage was it to the Jew to have the oracles of God? That's a good question. Uh, consider for a moment to, to answer that question, uh, the blind beggar uh, in John chapter 9. We won't read all that. It's actually, most of the chapter deals with this blind beggar, a man who was blind from birth. Uh, he, he, was, um, he could never see, never knew what sight was. Uh, perhaps he heard some people try to describe it to him, but can you imagine trying to describe sight to a blind man? Trying to describe colors, trying to describe, you know, and now you could feel the shapes, I suppose, uh, but, you know, trying to imagine that you could see them. And this man, man had never seen. He was unaware, literally, of what he was missing. And it's also said he was bankrupt. He was poor. He was a beggar. He was sitting beside the road there on the way into the temple. Uh, his condition wouldn't even allow him to go into the temple. Uh, uh, he, so he was in a place uh, uh, that be, where he could raise some money, perhaps. He had his alms dish out. He's begging for alms. Uh, and, and one day, you see, his condition placed him in a place where Jesus frequently passed by. And, and it just so happened that one day he was begging at the temple and our Lord passed by him. He didn't even know it was our Lord. He didn't cry out. He didn't say, Jesus, have mercy upon me. He didn't know anything. He was just begging, but our Lord stopped. And he, he told him to go wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam, and he would see. And he did, and he did see. And the rest of John chapter 9 talks about him jumping up and down, and the Pharisees weren't so happy, and they questioned him, and he says, I don't know, all I know is I can see now, and this man told me to wash my eyes, and I, I can see. And, and later he met the Lord again, and he was saved. Um, you know, his condition, the very things that had plagued him from birth, his blindness, his poverty, his dependence on begging, those very things were the things that led to his salvation. That's what placed him in the right spot. What advantage then hath the Jew? You know, much, Paul says every way. What advantage has the Christian? You know, I was drugged to church. Uh, I was made to go to Sunday school. I was made to read my Bible. I was made to read. What, a, what an advantage that is. <laughs> what a privilege that is. You know, it put you in the way of salvation. It put you in a place where you could hear God's word, where you could see God's word. It put you in a place where perhaps you might be saved. In a place of salvation, what advantage is in half the Jew? Paul says, much, every way. Um, he stands in a place where he can hear and perhaps respond to the word of God. Paul deals with that first challenge. What advantage is in half the Jew? Verse 3 uh, through 8. Verses 3 through 8 are perhaps one of the most difficult passages in all of the Bible. One of the most difficult passages in all the Bible. One of the most challenging, um, not from a doctrinal point of view, um, because, uh, you know, if it was a doctrinal point of view, you might have heard of it more on, but just from trying to understand these arguments. Paul makes some subtle uh, and closely woven arguments. He, um, most are inclined to simply move on <laughs> and perhaps ignore these few verses. Uh, yet, I have to say these verses were important to Paul, uh, and more importantly, these verses were important to the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul would have written it a little simpler if he could have, 
uh, perhaps, but the Holy Spirit was constraining him. The Holy Spirit was guiding his hand. Let's read these a few verses, verses 3 through 8. Paul says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, says Paul. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. Wow, challenging questions, challenging part of Scripture. Uh, these were challenges, no doubt, Paul had encountered again and again. And if we listen carefully, if we examine carefully Paul's arguments, we may hear the same objections, the same objections from perhaps unsaved colleagues at work, or perhaps some of our family members, we may hear the same objections. Uh, you see, Satan has only a limited portfolio of, of stuff, objections he can throw at us. You know, he's sifting through his papers and so what can I give him now? But, you know, he's only got the same little thin sheet of papers uh, to do. And, and, and so he's run out of stuff, out of new stuff to use. Uh, so he's forced to reuse the same arguments again and again and again throughout the centuries. What if some did not believe Paul states, uh, answering really an unstated question from one of his hecklers. Uh, Jews were, were given God's word. Uh, that's true, Paul. You, you just said that in verses 1 and 2. The oracles of God were given God's word. Uh, but so what? So what? You know, the Jews, they failed miserably. They failed as a people. They failed as a nation. You know, those oracles of God, they didn't do them any good. You know, what, what use was it? <laughs> uh, what if some did not believe um, wow. Paul says, uh, unbelief nullified God's promises for the Jews. Unbelief. I mean, God took them off into captivity. Now look at their pitiful state nowadays, uh, the Jews. Now they're under the oppression of Rome. Uh, they don't have a country of their own, uh, these Jews. I mean, they still stick to their religion. They still hold to their God. But they're in a bad way, Paul. Um, Paunch, look how diplomatic Paul was, first of all. How diplomatic Paul was. Paul says, for what if some did not believe? <laughs> what if some did not believe? How diplomatic Paul was. Uh, you know, the, the truth is, what if most did not believe? What if most did not believe? I mean, there was few who believed. Uh, the Jews, few. It was just a remnant of, of Jews who believed. A remnant who were faithful. Uh, Paul Paul's very diplomatic, though. <laughs> what if some did not believe? The principle he puts forth is most important. Uh, he, Paul says God's unconditional promises, unconditional, uh, don't depend on man's faithfulness. I mean, like, like duh. <laughs> God's unconditional promises do not depend on man. Do not depend on man. Uh, there, uh, they are, there are yet... Even to this very day, there are unfulfilled promises that were made to Israel that are yet to come. We study them when we look through the book of Revelation. Unfulfilled promises that are yet to be fulfilled. Israel is not yet coming to their land. Uh, what they have today is just a, a, a little shard of what God's promised them. Israel's, and, you know, then there's much opposition. You know, they have to put up barbed wire fences, they have to be armed guards carrying machine guns uh, around all the time. Israel has not yet come into their possession. What God has purposed, he will surely accomplish. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. God, Paul says, is never wrong. God is never wrong. In fact, as it turns out, the Jews' failures uh, and unbelief brings God's righteousness in, in like sharper focus. You know, it's like adjusting the lenses on your binoculars, and all of a sudden, it brings it into focus. Uh, God's justice, God's truth, into greater prominence. 
a greater display. I mean, God's righteousness really shines forth in view of the unfaithfulness of the Jews. Um, unbelief does not nullify God's promises. Uh, Paul says, God forbid, <laughs> verse 4, let God be a, li- a true, but every man a liar. God forbid. Don't even think about it. Uh, that, thou mightest, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. Thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. There's a second objection. Actually, there's a third objection buried under the second as well. Uh, but it's, why does God then punish my sin? If my unrighteousness magnifies his grace... I mean, I just said that the Jews, uh, the Jew, uh, his unrighteousness uh, magnified God's justice uh, and God's truth. It brought it into greater focus, greater prominence. And and the heckler, you know, jumps on that immediately. Jumps on it immediately. He says, uh, how clever, you see, how clever is the sinner? Uh, Perhaps you've wrestled with someone verbally uh, over this question of salvation. Perhaps you've wrestled with someone uh, and... They're like an eel. You know, you think you got them and, they, they, and you try to grab them again and off they go again. Uh, boy, how clever is the sinner when he's cornered? Uh, you know, you think you got them uh, and they wiggle out again. Uh, how, the heckler, how subtle. Uh, he takes, the heckler here takes Paul's claim, Paul's claim he just made uh, about the Jew, about the uh, uh, unbelief nullifies God's unrighteousness, uh, righteous, nullify, unbelief nullifies God's promises. He took that, the heckler did, he turned it around, you know, just, whoosh, 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 <laughs> turned it around and he attacked Paul. Touche is a term they use and when they're doing fencing, you know, if you, you got your opponent, touche, uh, it means like, hey, I didn't kill you, but I could have. <laughs> touche, uh, says the heckler. He says with glee, I got you, Paul. I got you. How can God punish those who through their sin are magnifying his righteousness. I mean, you're magnifying God's righteousness. How can God turn around and punish them? Touche. How unfair of God to punish at all. How unfair of God. Wow, the sinner, he's, <laughs> he's slippery. He's slippery. Paul is very careful to point out that this is the natural man's argument. This is not his argument. He says that in, in a little parentheses in verse 5. He says, I speak as a man. See that? And there's little parentheses around that. I speak as a man. Paul said, I'm, this is a natural man. This is not me. <laughs> I'm not saying this. Uh, let's not get confused. That's one reason why uh, this passage is difficult. Um, but he says, if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That's, this is a heckler. Uh, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And Paul says, hey, I'm speaking as a man. This is what the heckler is saying. Uh, Paul's response, God forbid, verse 6, God forbid, God forbid. Um, this is an absolutely impossible argument, Paul says. <laughs> take, take your touche back. <laughs> touche back to you, uh, Mr. Heckler. Uh, his brilliant response to the Jew, especially, was, how shall God judge the world? I mean, the Jew is just waiting for God's judgment. I mean, you know, God's I mean, I've been oppressed. I've been pushed down. The Romans have got their, their foot on my neck uh, in Rome, in Jerusalem. The Romans have got their foot on my neck. But one day, God's going to judge the Romans. One day, God's going to judge all those Gentile dogs out there. One day, the Jew uh, will be vindicated. <laughs> That's what the Jew is holding to. One day, God's going to judge. And Paul says, well, wait a minute. How can God, God if God can't judge anything, how's he going to judge those Gentiles, the Romans, how's he going to judge all those people you've been waiting for him to judge? Uh, wow. Uh, God, Paul even goes a little deeper than that. Uh, in a more personal note, in verse 7, he says, uh, God forbid, for how then shall God judge the world? Verse 7, for if, if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Uh, Paul puts it in a more personal form. Um, because the heckler needs to be silenced. The heckler is saying, let, 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 uh, let us do evil, the good may result. That's what the heckler uh, says. That, that's no doubt an argument that Paul's detractors used against him. You know, you're preaching this thing called grace. I mean, grace just means I can sin as much as I want to. Uh, grace. I mean, hey, I'm under grace. Uh, therefore, you know, <laughs> let's get out 
the cigarettes and the wine. Uh, let's have a good time. Uh, grace. I'm under grace. Um, an argument Paul's detractors had use. A man who claims this absurdity, it really is an absurdity, let us do evil that good may result. Uh, Paul says a man who claims this has committed moral and intellectual suicide. Uh, there's nothing is too bad for such a man. Um, Nothing is too bad. His condemnation is just. He violates every moral principle, and he has no defense. His damnation is just. Um, he says, uh, and not rather, as we be slanderously reported, some affirm that we say, again, Paul is saying that, yes, this has happened to me before many times. Let us do evil that good may come. His damnation, whose damnation is just. There is no argument that can stand against this because it's absurd, an absurd argument. Let us do evil, the good may come. Uh, notice carefully uh, Paul's method for handling these hecklers, uh, because perhaps you may have to handle a heckler or two in the future. Notice, let's look carefully at Paul's method. Uh, for Paul, in each case, each question, each challenge he had, fall, Paul falls back on the grand principles of scripture, the grand principles of doctrine, um, foundations of the faith is what Paul falls back on. He refuses to allow his detractors to drag him into the weeds, so to speak, drag him into the weeds and start to argue over uh, what about, you know, the, these hypothetical questions that, uh, that sinners are so good at pulling up. Paul refuses <laughs> to be drug into the weeds, uh, into the details, the obscurities of these challenges. Uh, to the first challenge, uh, you are attacking God's faithfulness. Paul says, God forbid. God forbid. God is faithful. God is faithful. He'd given the Jews the oracles of God. God's promises will never be unfulfilled. To the second challenge, you're attacking God's righteousness. Uh, Paul says, God forbid. God is absolutely righteous. To the third challenge, you're attacking God's justice, Paul says, those grand principles, God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, God's justice. Paul says, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid. God is right, God is just, God is faithful. Wow. Challenges uh, have been countered, these hecklers. Let's look at mankind's, mankind's day in court. We'll only get into this section. We'll continue this again next week. Mankind's day in court. Paul says, verse 9, what then are we better than they? What then are we better than they? Paul has just presented a devastating and a detailed expose of mankind, a beginning with that general indictment of man, what I've called a general indictment in Romans chapter 1, uh, then continuing with that indictment of, of um, the moral man, the religious man in Romans chapter 2, uh, and then the hecklers, uh, Paul has really included all of mankind. All of mankind's already been included. Yet still, yet still, Paul knew that there were some, uh, there were many, who were still making excuses. He says, what then are we better than they? You know, there were still some out in that country. Paul had, had preached through Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2 in his letter. Uh, there are some who are still saying, well, that doesn't apply to me. You know, that religious man, that's not me. I mean, I, I'm a Christian. I'm not a, just a religious man. I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I put my faith and trust in Him. I'm not that, more, I mean, uh, I, can, I, can, I can understand that the moral man, but that's not me, uh, that, that, that heathen, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, um, uh, man in chapter 1, that's not me at all. Uh, you, know, this, you know, we set it aside because we're really good at making excuses. Really, really good. Uh, my wife could tell you that. Because <laughs> I, like, I make excuses for everything. Excuses. Wow. Excuses. We're really good at making excuses. Uh, it's what we do best. Bestest, as Tigger would say. It's what we do bestest, is making excuses. Uh, Paul knew some were still making excuses. You know, Paul doesn't even excuse himself. He says, are we better than they? I mean, Paul's taking the position of a prosecuting attorney, and guess who's in the, the, the stand there? Himself. 
He's prosecuting himself. He says, hey, I'm there too. I make excuses. Uh, are we better than they? Are we better than those who have lived before us? Are we better educated? We say, well, yeah, <laughs> I'm better educated than those people in the past, I think, maybe. <laughs> uh, probably not. <laughs> All right. Um, I graduated from the college at schools in Nevada, after all. <laughs> Nevada, my daughter likes to point out, uh, is like the worst state in the, the nation for education. <laughs> so, anyway, I think it might be worse than Mississippi. Uh, you know, so if you're from Mississippi, I, I'm sorry, but Nevada's worse. Uh, so anyway, uh, are we better educated? <laughs> no. Are we superior in any way to those who have lived before us? Probably not. Are we more moral or more righteous, our society? Uh, well, certainly not. No, Paul says, no, no, we're all under sin. That's our condition. He says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, no way. And you know, Paul's a master teacher. He, he loves to repeat himself, which is good because sometimes you don't get it the first time. No, he says, in no wise. Um, uh, uh, for we have before proved, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they're all under Sin, that word under, is our condition. We are under sin. It's so sin, as God is pressed down, weighted down, under sin, under sin's authority, under sin's control. Well, under sin, under sin, from the moment of birth, I want to say from the moment of conception, that'd probably be more accurate, from the moment of conception, we're all under sin. Uh, all under sin. We're free. Our, our will is free. We're free what, to do what we want to do. We see uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote a long treatise on this, Freedom of the Will. He says it's the mind. The, the will is the mind, and the mind does what it thinks best. Doesn't your mind do what it thinks best for you? <laughs> That's what your mind does. And, and your mind uh, thinks, hey, it's not in my best interest uh, to... To, to seek after God. It's not in my best interest. I'm, I'm free to do anything I want to do, and what my mind wants to do is to sin. That's what I want to do. I'm free. <laughs> and, and free to sin. Free to sin. Free to do what I want to do, but not free to do as I ought to do. You see, man is under sin. Under sin. Uh, Proverbs, uh, we're slaves to sin. That's what under sin means. We're dominated by sin. We're under sin's dominion, under sin. That's the indictment Paul makes. Paul's indictment is most, most deadly. I mean, if you're sitting there in the docket, uh, you're under sin. Uh, um, that's all of us, humanity. Paul's case against humanity. Uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 4 says in part, it says, the plowing of the wicked is sin. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 21, 4. You can study that and read the rest of that verse. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's sinful to be a farmer. That does not mean it's sinful to be a farmer. That does not mean it's sinful to plow. There's nothing wrong with plowing your field uh, or anything connected with farming. Uh, but plowing of the, wick, the, the wicked is sin. What that says is that everything the unsaved man does is sin. Everything he does is sin. It's done apart from God. It's done without God, without any thought of God. Man's chief end is to glorify God, and yet the unsaved man is not glorifying God. He's out there plowing his field, and maybe he's cursing the stones and uh, you know, yelling at his cow, his bull, uh, or his tractor, uh, you know, whatever he's doing. And his, his thoughts are, are sinful thoughts. Uh, he's just enmeshed in sin out there, plowing his field, everything he does, even the good that he does. You know, he, he um, donates. I was just reading about a, a couple who donated all they had, millions, billions of dollars to a, uh, buy national parks for the country of Chile. They established national parks all up and down, uh, mostly southern Chile, buying up land and then giving it to the government for a national park. You think, well, that's really good. <laughs> not if you're not saved. You're just doing it for yourself. 
Think for yourself. You got the recognition that you wanted. You, 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 even if you didn't get any public recognition, you just feel good, you, don't you? I mean, you spent a billion for a, to buy some you know, mountainous territory where the penguins and the pumas can live on, on their own. Well, uh, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do. I like national parks in Chile. Uh, perhaps someday I could go visit one. Probably not. But anyway, <laughs> the evidence, Paul exposes this for all to see. All men are under sin. Uh, he presents the evidence now. It's not in the day of court. It's not like um, Paul's not going to present some evidence. He says, um, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin, as it is written. Here's the evidence. Uh, Paul begins to pull some passages out of Scripture, out of the Old Testament. Passages of the Jew was most familiar with, mostly from uh, pro, uh, Psalms, mostly from Psalms, uh, a number of verses. As it is written, Paul says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. The evidence uh, from the Old Testament, as it is written, is it, Paul's arguments, let me say a few general comments about them, and then we'll finish. His arguments are devastating, devastating. His reasoning is unassailable. Un, cannot be challenged, unchallengeable. He strips bare all the pretenses under which men try to hide. Uh, he proves, first of all, the universality, universality of sin more clearly and more plainly than any other scriptures. None righteous. He repeats himself for effect. No, not one. Never has been, never will be a righteous man, a righteous woman on their own. Never has been, never will be. He proves the universality of sin. He exposes for everyone to see the terrible character, the terrible nature of sin. What man is really like, apart from the grace of God. And now we thought we'd already exposed that in Romans chapter 1. I mean, it was pretty bad stuff. You know, it's the kind of stuff you almost hated to read out loud uh, to your children. Um, it's already been exposed, but now we have to say there's a, you know, maybe you've seen that sometimes on the uh, internet. If I'm on BBC and I'm looking up their news, and, and there's a little thing that says content warning. You know, it's in red. Content warning. You know, the following video depicts to to some scenes that you may not want to watch. Content warning. You know, there uh, some devastation in Yugoslavia, not U yeah, Ukraine, Ukraine. Uh, Yugoslavia has some devastation, no doubt, as well, but Ukraine, there's some devastation. Perhaps uh, there's some dead people laying on the street there. Their face is sort of obscured. Um, your content warning. Well, Paul needs to post that right now. Content warning. Um, it's not a pretty picture, what's coming up. Uh, but Paul must present this because it's preparation for the gospel. It's essential, Paul says, for evangelism, uh, because there must first be a conviction of sin before there can be a display of salvation. Evangelism does not, that does not start with a call to repentance and conviction of sin is unscriptural. Uh, sin must first be exposed before you can know that you need a Savior. And so Paul's going to do that, and we're going to do that next week. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we've studied this passage of Scripture, Lord, Paul's uh, arguments, Paul's counters to his hecklers. Lord, there's so much we can learn from that. I pray that you might help us to take uh, something home with us uh, today, Lord, something that we can use as we talk to family members or as you talk to colleagues, uh, perhaps just neighbors in the street, Lord. Let's remember that Paul always fell back upon the, the big principles of Scripture, Lord, the things that we need to emphasize again and again, the unassailable points. Uh, certainly, there are many uh, small points that uh, we can get distracted on, Lord, but um, uh, Paul didn't do that. He fell upon the big principles. Lord, as we uh, look ahead then uh, to this uh, day in court, Lord, for mankind, we're sort of uh, like a little nervous because uh, we're the ones on trial. Uh, humanity is, Lord, and as our sin is exposed, uh, we might uh, wiggle and squirm a little bit, but we understand this is necessary to expose, uh, to show the need for the gospel. Lord, why do we need the power of God? Well, we need the power of God because we're under the wrath of God. Uh, we need the power of God unto salvation. Why do we need God's righteousness? Because we're under God's wrath. Uh, Lord, I pray as we go forward in this study, you might help us to become better uh, Christians, better believers, because our doctrine is more sound and more secure. Now, we pray for the uh, service that follows, for the preaching and teaching of your word that might be with power, conviction. Lord, we pray for our worship that you might lift up our hearts.
in our minds, our voices, Lord, in song and in uh, uh, activities uh, that are pleasing to you as we worship you this day. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.